Welcome back to uh, Impact on Tuesday morning. It is my pleasure to be uh, in the studio today with Teresa Greenwood, uh, writer of fiction. (laughs) 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 Writer of crime fiction, short stories. Uh, Welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me, Russell. I really appreciate it. Teresa and I go back long enough that she gave me a hug when I saw her this morning. (laughs) She says it has a five-year rule there. I don't just dispense those (laughs) (laughs) willy-nilly. Teresa's been in the community for quite a while. Um, I know that you came, I think I was on council, or right around that time I was on council, you came to town the very first time, which is, can you believe that's eight years ago? I can't believe it. Wow. The time has flown. As everyone says in Fort McMurray, right? They, although we didn't actually come with like a, you know, a three-year, a five-year plan, but I didn't think eight years were going to whip by so quickly. They go by so mm. fast and... You uh, are not from here originally, uh, somewhere in Ontario, you said. I am. I'm from the Thousand Islands region of Ontario. So it's the, the Thousand Islands, or Thousand Island, that uh, uh, roll up the St. Lawrence River, and sort of half of them are in New York State and half are in Ontario. In reading a number of the stories in the book that we're here to talk about, which is a collection of short stories called Kill As You Go, um, uh, uh, several, the, the first three that I read mm-hmm. were set in that part of the world, I believe, mm-hmm. That's right. And um, I really got the sense that you have a fascination with the history of the place you grew up in. Is that correct? That, that's absolutely true. It's, uh, Wolf Island is a, is a, and it's a beautiful island. I encourage anybody, if you're in Ontario and you're in the Kingston region, take the free ferry. There's a free 100-car ferry that goes over to the island, you know, trips back and forth all day. Get an ice cream cone, wander around because it looks exactly the same now as it looked in 1950. There's no Walmarts and no parking meters. It's a very agrarian, rural sort of town with a little village in it, and the the views are just spectacular. We know you through your professional Mm -hmm. roles that you've Mm -hmm. had in the community with uh, the municipality, with Keanu College, Mm -hmm. and most recently with the Wood Buffalo Housing Development Corporation. But the writing, talk... Well, how did this happen? <laughs> and and uh, how long has it been going on? I know that yeah. early on when we first met, you mm-hmm. talked about your writing. But how long have you been doing it? And, and give us a sense of w- where this has taken you. Sure. Well, I started out as a journalist. So uh, when I first got out of university, I was a reporter for about seven years. And one of the things that you do, that, the fun part is the writing part, right? So you, you, you get in the discipline of writing every day. And you get in the discipline of having to meet your deadline because the, the press is roll without you and there's just a giant blank spot where your story is supposed to be. So that was a really good training to get in the practice of writing all the time. But I always wanted to write fiction. And some of the things that I carried over from my journalism career is I really like writing dialogue. I really enjoy that. And I really like looking at the history of an area and and creating – when you're a small-town journalist, as you, as you know from your radio background – you, you're completely integrated into the community, and the community actually becomes a character in your stories, right? So there's a, there's a tone and a tenor to the community that you kind of capture. And a part of that is the history as well. So it just seemed like a natural thing to take with me into my fiction. My brain is going a million different ways, but i got to ask the Always, question. Always, Russell. Oh. <laughs> Always. So as, as I'm reading uh, these stories, uh-huh. and um, they're lovely. Oh, thank uh, you. I get the sense... Especially the one we were just we were just talking about, Doctor Doctor, what's his name? Doctor Spanky's car. <laughs> Doctor Spanky's car. So Doctor Spanky <laughs> ended up sinking um, his car. Is it in the St. Lawrence? I don't know. Some it's it, yeah, body it's, of water. it's right where the Lake Ontario meets the St. Yeah. Lawrence River. Doctor Spanky's car, mm-hmm. but, but it's set in a different mm-hmm. time. It is. It's set. It's set around Prohibition. So my question yeah. is. I, I felt like mm-hmm. I was in a different time. You're using different mm-hmm. words, uh, different sayings, different names. Mm-hmm. The, the names mm-hmm. of that period are very different than mm-hmm. the names we know today. So as, as a writer, how do you go about getting those elements into the story and placing it in, a, in an era? Is it something that happens in your brain and is it very methodical mm-hmm. or is it just something that pours out of you? I, I'm really glad you noticed that, Russell, because... I, I, I do, I'm not the kind of writer who likes to describe a lot of the scenery and things. And, I'm, and I really try to create that sense of time through dialogue and, and, a, and a brief description. 
And a quick way to do it, to, uh, to signal to your readers that something's set in the past, is to throw a horse in there, horse and wagon. So my, yep. my husband calls my stories tales of woe because I always seem to have a runaway wagon in there somewhere to, to let people know. But also because when we were little kids on the island and, and we had terrible television reception back in those days, and uh, actually I think they still do because they don't have cable over there. And... Um, we just listened to stories from our elders. And so one of the things we did every night, one of us went down to our grandparents who lived in what would be in city terms about a block away. And our grandfather would tell us stories from when he was a little boy in the late 1800s. And a lot of his words and phrases and the names of the characters and people like Dr. Spanky, who was a real person, have sort of, they've become embedded in my consciousness, I guess. And so... Uh, you find them floating out free form into into your short stories. But Dr. Spanky, by the way, was the local, he was the the reeve of the township, the MLA, the doctor. He gave everybody legal advice. And so it, in that certain generation of people on Wolf Island, he was the, the hero of all the stories, you know, the, the lead character. So he kind of naturally crept into one of mine. I love it. I, I think of my father. Mm-hmm. He uses a phrase, let's test mm-hmm. Steph if she knows what, mm-hmm. do you know what two bits means? No, she's her eyes are <laughs> rolling up in her head. Matt, do you know what two bits is? He has no idea. Uh, do you know I, what yes, two bits? Yes, yeah. it's a quarter. It's a quarter. Yeah. yeah, and that's a language from uh, probably yeah. the Great Depression era, right. World War II era. I don't know what it refers to, but two bits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you have these little nuggets mm-hmm. of words and phrases and sayings, and again the names that I can't remember what the name was that I. I Red, but oh yeah, that's a name from a long time. Oh, like Everett and Sheldon. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> Sheldon's come back in since Big Bang Theory, but uh, it was a name that I heard a lot when I was a kid, and then you didn't yeah. hear it for. Talk for quite about some time. the. Um, you, you, you briefly talked about the uh, the, the practice of writing. Um, when you're working on your short stories, mm-hmm. when is the sweet spot for you? Like, what what is your practice? Uh, well, I, you know what, I have, as I mentioned before, I take some tips out of journalism with me, and one of the things, and some of the stories in this um, series were actually written for a newspaper summer mystery series that my friend Jake Doherty, who is the publisher of the Week Standard when I worked there, and I talked the big shots in Toronto into doing this mystery series. For, I think we did it for about eight years in a row. And we could only do 3,000 words because you have to sell the ads around the copy, and so I got in the habit of writing 500 words, throwing in a twist, 500 words, and throwing in a twist. And so I realized almost all of my stories are 3,000 words now. A few are a little bit longer. But if you can't tell the story in 3,000 words, more or less, in my theory, it's probably not a short story. It's either a novella or maybe even a novel. And if you've got too many ideas to cram into something that short, park it and save it for, save it for something else. Do you go into the story uh, knowing how it's going to end? Or never. You, never. <laughs> I'm a, you're either a plotter, which means you plot them out, or a pantser, which means you do it by the seat of your pants. And I'm a total pantser. <laughs> but I, what I usually I have the characters are very clear in my mind, and the initial action is very clear in my mind. And then if you do have your characters right, usually the action will make sense when you when you get to the end of it. I hope. Uh, Teresa lived in Abbasand right. around the time of the fire, yep. and uh, she wrote one of the stories mm-hmm. in this collection of short stories called Kill As You Go. Uh, it's not about the fire, but it is around the fire. We're going to talk about that when we come back with more of Impact. My guest this morning is local author uh, Teresa Greenwood. We'll come back with more right after this. Welcome back to Impact. Talking writing today with Teresa Greenwood, a local author, uh, a, a crime a sh- short story collection called Kill As You Go. It actually feels nice. It's, <laughs> I've got a copy in front of me. I know you can't see it on the radio, but it actually has a lovely feel to it and a beautiful design. Uh, it is Coffin Hop Press out of Calgary? Out of Calgary. Out of Calgary. That's, that's, right, that's yeah. put that out. Um, during the fire, because you, you went through it like most of us did. In fact, you lost a home in the fire up in Abbasan. I did, yeah. Uh, talk to me oh, that day. Like, what, what happened that day Well, you? It, 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 you know, it, it, same thing that happened to everybody else, right? You're, you start out with a, just a really ordinary day, and the smoke is a long way away. 
And then all of a sudden you look out the window and, and your life's changed, right? And so we, I happened to be home that day. I had about 15 minutes to get everything packed up and, and in the car. And I'm glad you asked about it. Russell, we, we haven't talked about this, but I actually have a book coming out in the spring, a memoir with the University of Alberta Press that talks about the things I grabbed in that 15 minutes, basically, and, and put in the, in, the, in the car to take with me. And then later, I know everybody in Fort McMurray has the same story of you grabbed a whole bunch of stuff, you threw them in the car, and then you're thinking, why the hell did I just grab those things? Yeah. What random thing was going through my head when I... When I did it, and and I, being a writer, had the luxury of sitting down and poking around with it for a little while. And I had a couple of really good editor friends that I'd worked with in the past, who one in Vancouver and one in Ontario, who felt so sorry for me for losing my my house that they helped me put this book together. So, um, and I think it's not really going to tell anybody in Fort McMurray anything that they don't already know, probably. But I'm hoping it does help us get our story out a little bit more to the to the larger community. Had you and your husband had a conversation prior to that day about, well, if this goes squirrely, what should we do? Had you had that conversation? We did, but only because, as you may recall, Russell, when I worked at the municipality, I was the public information officer on the emergency management team. So I had gone home and packed my go bag because you, it, not so much here, but it, I was also a PIO on a emergency team back in Ontario and you had to always have a go bag pack just like on that TV show you know where the FBI agents yep. pack it mm-hmm. in case you were in the uh, emergency shelter for for 72 hours so I had a 72 hour bag packed and I had a bag packed with all the things they tell you to take like your birth certificate passport safety deposit box keys and I had both of them sitting by the door mm-hmm. so uh, but that was just a training thing more yeah. than a but because we were had both had training in it, and I had back in Kingston also, you, uh, you, some of your listeners, if they were in Ontario, may remember we had a, a bad ice storm, and yep. that shut the town down for about three weeks. So after that, they took the emergency training pretty seriously. So we all had it drilled into us. As a fellow creator, mm-hmm. uh, I'm a writer, a painter. Mm-hmm. Uh, my response mm-hmm. to that event, even though I didn't mm-hmm. lose my house. I needed to paint. Mm-hmm. Did you need to write? And if so, how soon after losing your home and f- you were evacuated yeah. somewhere, did you start to write? You know what? I, I wasn't writing. And then I have a really dear, dear friend, uh, George Featherling, who was president of the Writers' Union at the time. And he was an old friend from my newspaper days. We worked at the same newspaper. And he phoned me up and he said, how's your book coming along? And I'm like, what what book, George? And he said, well, you, you must be writing a book about the fire. You're like, writers have to write. And I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't really know how this is going to end yet. And he, he really encouraged me to just start getting into that discipline, putting your bum down in the seat, opening up the computer, and just starting to rate, um, you know, what was ever at the top of your mind. And as you know, as an artist, it's not what you think is mm-hmm. at the top of your mind. It's always the exact opposite of what you think you're really thinking about. Yeah. And uh, but George also helped me put some discipline in it. So we wrote an outline, figured out what the story was going to be, sent the story off to the publisher. And and also as an artist, you'll you'll laugh when you hear. So the very first place we sent the outline, they bought it, which never happens. Like most people have to you go at least a dozen times. But I, it was probably the magnitude of the story, the fire, and the fact that. Uh, the president of the Writers Union of Canada sent it in for me. I think got me up to the top of the line. So it's the other thing about the fire that you that as you know, Russell, you find all these lovely people from your life coming back into your life, trying to help you and yeah. trying to do things for you. And it, that's one of the gifts of, from the experience. So the the story in the in the collection "Kill as You Go" about May third, two thousand sixteen, mm-hmm. is called "Cry Havoc." That's right. Um, Tell us about it. Well, as a theater guy, you would know where the phrase cry havoc is. is <laughs> and first, let loose yeah. the dogs of war. That's right. Yeah. It's, 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 so it's from Shakespeare and one of the Henrys. You probably know which one. And uh, it's also famous for being in one of the Star Trek movies because Christopher Plummer shouts it out as he's as a Klingon going into battle. And uh, But uh, what I wanted to try to do in a story was recreate that feeling that we all had that day of a life interrupted so you're just having a perfectly ordinary day, 
and then all of a sudden everything changes and you're faced with these split second decisions that you have to make and you and you don't know what the outcome is going to be but whatever you thought it was going to be that's not it every everything shifted and and everything has changed and the funny thing so and I wrote that story and I really uh I I did something with the ending that I'd never done before I'm not going to give it away but it's a little different ending than you would ordinarily find in a nice tidy little mystery story and uh, so I wrote that story and then I was putting this collection together for Coffin Hop and I thought I wonder if I'm going to see as I look over all of my stories how is how has the fire changed my writing what's what's the difference going to be and I realized I'd always been drawn to that idea of that split second decision there's no do over you have to decide because a lot of my characters are just ordinary people faced with something extraordinary that suddenly comes up and they have to make a decision that kind of tests their mettle. And, and not all of my characters live up to it. And, and some have different kinds of endings. And, not, and, and, so, and it really is something, the undiscovered country in yourself, I guess. What, you, you don't know what you're going to do until you're, you're faced with it. And I, that's one of the amazing things about the story of Fort McMurray because who could have, who could have predicted? You might have thought it, but you couldn't have known for sure that the whole town was going to pull together like it did to make sure that everybody got out safely and that all these people were going to help each other. So it's, it's, that's, I don't know why that idea fascinates me, but it's clearly always fascinated me because it's in almost all of my 14 stories and they go back about 15 years. So I must have been thinking about it for some time. How the heck did you pick uh, a bylaw officer is your subject to that story. Like, where did that come from? Like, did you just, okay, what can I write about? <laughs> oh, I, I remember there was this guy playing with a dog. Like, where yeah, did it come from? It, it, well, it's a little bit of the mechanics of writing a mystery story. So if you think of all of those episodes of Law & Order where someone stumbles over a, a dead body, you know, at the beginning of every episode of Law & Order, you have to have a reason for the person to be there finding it. And uh, so uh, that's why so many people use police, obviously, or lawyers or journalists as, as their detectives. But I like to mix it up a little bit. And, uh, and I actually hardly ever, occasionally I use journalists because I was one, but I hardly ever use the, the traditional detective character. But you have to have a legitimate reason for someone wandering onto somebody's property and finding something. And also, having worked in a municipality, you know, you hear all kinds of crazy stories from the bylaw officers <laughs> of things that they've seen and, and just silly, the silly stuff that people, mostly harmless, that people get up to. So I knew there was an element of comedy in there as well, that, and I like to throw like, some humor into my stories as well. Yeah. Well, I love your comment that all of us that day had our mm -hmm. own things, mm -hmm. normal things that were happening. Mm -hmm. I remember my wife was working with a client in the mm -hmm. basement. All of a sudden, that person's phone starts going mm -hmm. insane, and that's how they, they realized something was going wrong. And I was here doing a radio show that morning. So watch for it. Kill As You mm -hmm. Go is the collection of short stories. Cry Havoc is the short story set on May 3rd, 2016. My guest is Teresa Green. We're going we're to come back and talk about the business. I'm very fascinated by the business of writing and mm -hmm. how you – Get the word out about a project like sure. this. Uh, you're listening to, uh, listening and watching on Shaw Cable uh, to Impact here this morning. It is a team effort of United Way, Fuse Social, Shaw TV, Fort McMurray, uh, YMM, your McMurray Magazine, and 91.1 The Bridge. Welcome back to Impact. I'm so glad today that we're talking about writing and and the literary arts. I don't know if we've done a show about that uh, on Impact yet. So, Teresa Greenwood, thanks for coming in and sparking the dialogue. Oh, I'm delighted. It's I had a young, a young fellow just mm -hmm. the other day reach out who said, I I, I'm kind of a closet poet mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do with that <laughs> and, I and I don't know who to connect with. And uh, so I linked that person up with the Northward mm -hmm. folks. And, uh, oh, um, great. And it's so lovely to hear mm -hmm. what you're doing with your mm -hmm. writing from Home Base mm -hmm. Fort McMurray, a uh, book of a collection of mm -hmm. short stories called Kill As You Go, recently released. Mm -hmm. That's right, just uh, three weeks ago in Calgary. So yeah. tell me, I know mm -hmm. this is not the best-selling romance or, <laughs> or the, the, the latest novel on the mm -hmm. shelf, 
But how do you, what's the business approach to it? And, and how do you, sure. so you, you mentioned that you had mm-hmm. a great success down in Calgary. So what happened? I know I was really surprised because uh, this is my first, coll- it takes forever to get enough short stories for a, a book, but this was my first short story collection. And uh, so I went down to Calgary to this uh, literary festival called When Words Collide that I guess they have annually. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish I'd gone before, and it's a mix of genres, and, and there were lots of people dressed in Outlander costumes, which was really fun, and people dressed as World War I flying aces, and, and it just had a great atmosphere. And I really wasn't expecting to sell a lot of books, but we actually sold out of all of the books that we brought to the event and which was all that we had printed so much so that we I had five free author copies and I had I turned them back in so that the publisher could sell them at the event and I've just never had an experience like that before but I think it has a lot to do there were 700 people at the event and I think they're just it's an Alberta thing in that they're just incredibly supportive of people who are trying to do art that celebrates their communities so I was, but then I also uh, was uh, in Kingston for a couple of weeks on a summer vacation and took some books into the local bookstore, and then they sold out as well. So I think a lot of it has been uh, marketing through social media. You know, your network of people sees you, and, and you're really the expert on that more than I am, Russell. But uh, one of the things I'm going to try next week off my brand new website is uh, a free ebook download where you take one story from the collection. And, and people can download it for free in the hope that they'll go back and either order, you know, the Kindle or the hard copy from, from Amazon as well. And also, it's the, it's the first time I've had a new release uh, for sale on Amazon, and I'm surprised at how well the sales have been going on that, too. So I'm, I'm learning as I go. Killing and learning as we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you obviously uh, love writing stories. Uh, Are you a reader of short stories as well? I am. I For years, I've had a subscription to Ellery Queen magazine, which is um, uh, old school. Uh, some of your listeners, I'm sure, have probably never heard of it. But it's a uh, tradition started really uh, back in the days of the pulp magazines and uh, uh, Dashiell Hammett and Philip Marlowe and, and things like that. And so... For decades, they've had this tradition of publishing short mystery stories. And I've had, this is my bragging part, I've had two short stories myself published in there, which is what every Canadian sh- mystery short story writer wants to get a story in Ellery Queen. It's it's your, you, you know, I, I'm sure it's the same for a visual artist like you. There must be a gallery that you want to be in, that that's the thing that that when you have, you, you can beat your chest and go around bragging to all your friends about that's sort of, but it doesn't mean that much, I'm sure, to your general listenership. What's yeah. it, t- talk about the joy for mm-hmm. you of reading short stories, because mm-hmm. I know the general market probably reads novels, longer mm-hmm. things, but talk about the joy of short stories. Sure. Well, you know, I, one of the things, I, I just finished a collection. There's a, a guy down in the States called Otto Penzler, who's famous in New York for every year. He runs, a, he runs a, the most famous mystery bookstore in, in New York City. And every year he does a collection of the best American short stories, short mystery stories. And it's, a, it, it's just a lot of fun. If you read them over the years, too, you can see how the genres shifted a little bit. And it's coming out, you know, if you go back to the 70s, it's a lot of Mickey Spillane, hard-boiled detective, um... You know, and with dames and hot tomatoes and all that kind of stuff. And then as the years roll along, you see writers like, um, um, oh, the, her name's escaping me, but everybody knows where she did the A is for alibi and B is for burglar, Sue Grafton. And you start seeing female hard-boiled detectives come in and female cops and female lawyers. And then gradually it starts shifting out. So you see just a wider variety of more diverse characters coming into play and, and writers like Walter Mosley bringing in uh, uh, detectives from different backgrounds. And it's a really neat way to see all these stories encapsulated in one publication to just get a little bit of variety in, in what you're reading and also a, a little bit of a window on society too. How do people get a hold of yours? It's called Kill As You Go. Yeah. It's a collection of short stories by Teresa mm-hmm. Greenwood. I'm, I have a copy, and I think we're going to have th- this given away through the radio station here in the next little while. But how do people get a hold of one? Well, it's it's on Amazon.ca, also okay. .com. I don't know why you would get it from there, though. And so that's the quickest. And you can get the uh, Kindle and ebook copy as well as the hard copy. And also there's information on my 
uh, social media and, and, and website. Yeah, you and said that you have a new website. I do, and it's my, my website is www.therese, T-H-E-R-E-S-E dot C-A. Yes, I do pronounce it. Teresa, but my mother is Dutch, and so she thought that you spelled it without an A. <laughs> so I've been spelling it. My I remember spelling it in grade one, and 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 failing on the test because I had supposedly spelled it wrong. But anyway, it's t h e r e s e dot c a. So there's lots of information there for people as well. Thank you for the shameless plug, Russell. I really appreciate it. Well, it's wonderful to celebrate local artists and writers mm-hmm. doing some really cool mm-hmm. things. The collection, again, mm-hmm. is Kill As You Go by Teresa Greenwood. Teresa, spell <laughs> T-H-E-R-E-S-E. Very important, mm-hmm. available on Amazon. And it's a really wonderful collection. I'm about four stories in and loving it so far. Teresa, thanks mm-hmm. for coming in. Thank you, Russell. It was a pleasure. Teresa Greenwood, uh, local writer of short fiction, among other things. Uh, and you've been listening to Impact. It is a team effort of United Way, Fuse Show, Social, Shaw TV, Fort McMurray, YMM Magazine. And it, none of it would happen without our friends right here at 91.1 The Bridge. The Bridge.